Hello friends, welcome to Dungeons & Dragonfly, where I adapt various characters for use in d and I'm Dragonfly9078, and today I'll be doing something a little different. Now, it was requested that I build Maple, the main character from Bofuri, but I decided, what the heck, and went the extra mile, so today we're doing both Maple and her best friend Sally. And no, it isn't just because I really like the picture I found for the thumbnail and it has both of them in it, whoever told you that is a filthy liar. Anyway, Maple is actually just the screen name of Kaede Honjo in New World Online, a brand new virtual reality MMO. She was convinced to play by her best friend, Sally's player, Risa Shiramine, who couldn't start playing herself because she had to study. Kaede isn't much of a gamer, so she selected the Great Shielder class and dumped all her stat points into defense, reasoning that if her defense was high enough, she wouldn't get hurt. She quickly acquired skills that made her incredibly tough, and through her unorthodox playstyle, she managed to accidentally stumble her way into being one of the strongest characters in the entire game. So, what do we want from this build? Well, first of all, we need to be nearly indestructible, using shields for everything from attacking, to defending, and even to casting spells. Next, we'll need Maple's wide array of skills, many of which come with some kind of transformation into increasingly formidable forms. And finally, despite being a walking death meme, underneath it all, Maple's just a girl having fun playing a game with her friends so we'll need the interpersonal skills that made her the leader of her own guild. Looking over at ability scores, as much as I'd like to do a point buy and max out constitution while dumping everything else, we actually do have multi-classing minimums, so we'll be using the standard point array. If you want to roll for stats, that's fine, just make sure your strength and charisma are at least 13. Starting off with a 13 in strength, Maple wears heavy armor and carries a shield, both of which are pretty bulky. We'll dump dexterity though, Maple has zero agility, to the point that she even walks noticeably slower than everyone else. Constitution is 15, we'll need as much HP as we can get, and we'll be working with poisons regularly. Our 12 will go into Intelligence. Maple is bright, and comes up with creative ways to use her skills, but she can be a bit of an airhead, and honestly thinks she's playing the game normally, so Wisdom is gonna be a 10. And we'll finish up with a 14 in Charisma. She's instantly likable, and is genuinely friendly toward everyone she meets. Now, Kaede is a human, but Maple is a character in a fantasy game, so we'll make her a fantasy race. She's short and slow, so Dwarf fits our needs nicely, specifically the Hill Dwarf. All Dwarves get plus two to their constitution, and Hill Dwarves in particular get plus one to their wisdom. We also get 60 feet of dark vision, and to go with our low dexterity making us slow, our walking speed is only 25 feet. Something to note is that Dwarves in particular are not slowed down by wearing heavy armor, so we can leave our strength at 13 and still wear plate armor. Dwarves are resilient, and Hill Dwarves are tough, giving us resistance to poison damage, advantage on saves against poison, and an extra 1 HP per level. All dwarves also get proficiency with smiths, masons, or brewers tools, none of which are particularly in character, so I picked smiths tools to represent Iz, since she focuses on smithing. We also get to use double our proficiency bonus on history checks about stonework, as well as getting proficiency with a handful of dwarf weapons. We get all simple and martial weapons from our first class though, so I'm not going to go into those. Maple manages to accidentally her way into a unique set of powerful armor without meaning to, so I'm going to call her an Inheritor. We get proficiency with Survival and Arcana, as well as with a gaming set like Othello. Though, since we're playing a virtual game, Survival isn't especially important, so we're going to switch that up for performance. We also get an Inheritance, which is pretty loosely defined and is usually set up between you and your DM, so I'm going to take a second to talk about the Shield of Missile attraction. It's a cursed shield that gives you resistance to the damage of ranged weapon attacks, but also makes any ranged weapon attacks made against targets within 10 feet of you target you instead. Needless to say, this is a fantastic item for a tank, so if you can get your hands on it, it would be really good for Maple. We're going to need proficiency with heavy armor and shields, so we're going to start off as a fighter, also getting us two skills from the fighter list, like animal handling and perception. For our fighting style, I like defense to give us plus one to RAC while we wear armor, but if you want to lean more into the tank role, then protection can give disadvantage to an attack targeting a creature within five feet of us, and interception can reduce the damage from such an attack by 1d10, plus our proficiency bonus. We also get second wind, letting us down a quick health potion to heal 1d10 plus our fighter level as a bonus action once per rest. Next we'll jump over to bard, which gives us proficiency with any one skill. Persuasion will help us grow our guild and get people to be friends with us. We also learn how to help those friends with Bardic Inspiration, a pool of D6s that refills on a long rest and that we can give out with our bonus action. 
One time in the next 10 minutes, the friend we give the die to can roll it and add the result to an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Second level bards get jack of all trades, letting us add half our proficiency bonus to any ability checks we make that we aren't proficient with. Maple is new to gaming in general, so she isn't especially familiar with most things, but her unusual and intuitive playstyle lets her cope anyway. This does apply to initiative rolls as well, so we can get our shield up in time to fight despite our low dexterity. We also get Song of Rest, letting us and our allies heal an additional d6 on a short rest. I'm going to call this Maple's Meditation skill, which recovers her HP over time, but doesn't let her attack while she's using it. We get to turn two of our skills into expertises at third level. My picks are Animal Handling, to better trade Syrup and Obero, and Persuasion because Maple is just a genuine sweetheart, which goes a long way when talking to people. She's also really good at attracting attention, so for our Bard College, we'll go with the College of Glamour. With Mantle of Inspiration, we can use our Bardic Inspiration to give ourselves a wondrous appearance. When we do, we pick a number of creatures up to our Charisma modifier within 60 feet, which can include us, by the way. Those creatures gain 5 temporary HP and can immediately use their reaction to move up to their speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Our Charisma isn't going higher than 14, so we can use this to get the twins out of danger when we've been knocked back too far to cover them. The amount of temporary HP we give goes up to 8 at 5th level, 11 at 10th level, and 14 at 15th level. We also get Enthralling Performance. Once per rest, if we perform for at least a minute, we can try to charm a number of creatures who watch the performance equal to our Charisma modifier, so 2. If those creatures fail a wisdom save, they're charmed for up to an hour, unless they take damage or we attack them or their allies. While charmed, they idolize us and talk about us to anyone they meet. Maple literally has a chat room dedicated to protecting her after her first day playing the game because one guy saw her and talked about her to his friends. She is canonically a meme in-universe. Fourth level gets us our first ability score improvement. The Shield Training feat rounds off our constitution to 18, gives us proficiency with shields, and lets us pick up or throw down our shield as a free action. But more importantly, it lets us cast spells with our shield by letting us use it as a spellcasting focus. If I'm honest, Warcaster is probably a better choice here since we already have shield proficiency, and it also lets us cast spells while holding a shield, among other useful benefits. But I went with Shield Training because it'll also let us cap our constitution by the end of the build, and Warcaster wouldn't. 5th level is all about our bardic inspiration. The dice bump up to d8s, and thanks to Font of Inspiration, they now refill on any rest, not just a long rest. 6th level bards get Counter Charm, letting us use our action to give our allies within 30 feet advantage on saves against being charmed or frightened. I would imagine it's pretty hard for them to be scared with Maple between them and the enemy to soak up the hits. Glamour bards also get Mantle of Majesty. This lets us transform for up to a minute with our concentration. While we're transformed, we can cast Command with our bonus action for free every turn. This isn't really in Maple's wheelhouse, unless she really leverages her fame or status as a guild leader, but that doesn't strike me as something she would do. We can only transform once per day, and we'll have better things to spend our concentration on, so don't worry too much about this one. For our second feat, Magic Initiate will give us two cantrips and a first level spell from the Wizard list. Poison Spray is the first skill from our Hydra powers, forcing a constitution save on a creature within 10 feet dealing up to 4d12 poison damage on a fail. Toll the Dead is going to be our Seeping Chaos, dealing up to 4d8 necrotic damage to a creature within 60 feet who fails a wisdom save. If they're missing any HP already, the damage dice bump up to d12s as our predators prey on their weakness. We can only cast the first level spell once per day, but that's okay because we're going to go with Find Familiar to get our beloved pet Syrup, who, I mean, just look at him. Look at him! He is too cute. Now, turtles aren't actually a valid choice for Find Familiar, so if your DM doesn't let you pick a turtle, I would reflavor either a crab or maybe a lizard. At 9th level, our Song of Rest die bumps up to a d8, and at 10th level, our Bardic Inspiration dice bump up to d10s. We also get two more expertises, take Arcana to intuit new ways to use skills, and Performance, because that performance when Maple was trying to fool the Queen Bee was masterful and deserves all of the awards. And now we come to the main reason I made Maple a bard, other than the performance that gets people who watch you to talk about you to their friends. Bards get to pick up magical secrets, letting them mix and match spells from any spell list, so we can pick up whatever wacky transformations or skills we want. Odaluk's Resilient Sphere will do for Wooly, enshrouding us in an impenetrable ball that is impervious to attacks and that we can roll around in like a hamster ball. Watery Sphere will serve as our stand-in for Venom Capsule, 
creating a ball of water that can enclose us and up to three other medium creatures. We can move the ball 30 feet as an action, and if it goes over a cliff, it'll safely descend until it's hovering 10 feet off the ground. Then once it ends, it drops us prone on the ground with all the water. Now, technically, it only encloses us if we fail a strength save, and technically, we can't voluntarily fail a saving throw unless the spell says we can. But that never really made sense to me. I mean, if we aren't resisting and in fact are actively jumping into it, we shouldn't have to make a save. As always, talk to your DM. For our next ability score improvement, the Shield Master feat gives us our shield attack, letting us push a creature 5 feet with our shield as a bonus action after taking the attack action. It also lets us cope with deck saves a little bit better, adding our shield's AC to any deck saves we make against effects that only target us, and giving us pseudo evasion against area of effect deck saves. If we succeed on a save against a fireball or something similar that deals half damage on a success, we can use our reaction to devour the effect with our shield, taking no damage instead. This does only devour the bit that would hit us though, it doesn't protect our allies. At level 13, our Song of Rest die becomes a d10, and at level 14 we get Unbreakable Majesty for another transformation. Once per rest, we can use our bonus action to transform for a minute, during which the first creature to attack us each turn has to make a charisma save. If they fail, they have to either target someone else or lose the attack, and if they succeed, they can go through with the attack, but have disadvantage on saves against our spells during our next turn so it might actually be worse for them to succeed than to fail. Speaking of spells, we get two more magical secrets at this level. Telekinesis is a direct stand-in for Maple's Psychokinesis, letting us lift a huge or smaller creature or an object weighing up to a thousand pounds into the air, then move it up to 30 feet each round. The spell lasts for 10 minutes, so we could hypothetically move a giant turtle a good half mile per cast. We'll also pick up Draconic Transformation, which I've picked to represent Maple's Machine God Transformation. For up to a minute with our concentration, we get a 40 foot flying speed, blind sight out to 30 feet, letting us see anything that isn't behind total cover, including any invisible creatures. And when we cast the spell and as a bonus action on our turns afterward, we can fire a full barrage from our laser cannons, dealing 3d8 force damage to every creature in a 30 foot cone who fails a dexterity save, half that on a success. At level 15, our Bardic Inspiration die maxes out and becomes a d12. At level 16, we'll use an Ability Score Improvement to cap up our Constitution. And at level 17, our Song of Rest die also maxes out as a d12. 18th level bards get our last two magical secrets. Holy Aura is our stand-in for Loving Sacrifice. It creates a 30-foot aura around us for up to a minute. Creatures of our choice who are in that radius when we cast the spell get advantage on all saving throws and any attacks against them have disadvantage for the duration even if they leave the radius. Also, any fiends or undead who hit one of our protected friends with a melee attack have to make a constitution save or be blinded until the spell ends. Illusory Dragon is not a transformation, but is a good approximation of Hydra, conjuring a magical dragon for up to a minute. When the dragon appears, any of our enemies who can see it have to make a wisdom save to avoid being frightened for a minute. During our turn, we can move the dragon up to 60 feet as a bonus action and make it exhale a blast of the energy of our choice in a 60-foot cone, dealing 7d6 of that kind of damage to every creature in the area who fails an intelligence save, half on a success. We pick the type of energy when we conjure the dragon. Since this is Hydra, the obvious choice is poison, but acid is actually not a bad alternative, since the poison dragon that Maple fought did melt her sword and shield with its breath, and poison immunity is pretty common at high levels. Our capstone is the 19th level of Bard for one last ability score improvement, and it's hard to beat taking the tough feat for an extra 2 HP per level. Combine that with our Dwarven Toughness and our maxed out constitution, and we're getting an extra 8 HP per level on top of whatever we roll on our hit dice. Taking a look over at spellcasting, we didn't multi-class spellcasters of course, so we ended up as a 19th level spellcaster, but we do need to keep an eye on our intelligence for our magic initiate spells. For cantrips, Blade Ward gives us resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for a turn, and Message sends a quick whisper to one of our friends within 120 feet. We'll pick up Featherfall, since we can literally grow wings to slow our fall with, and Sleep is one of several spells we'll be using for our Paralyzing Shout, putting up to 5d8 HP worth of creatures within 20 feet of a point we choose to sleep for a minute, or until they take damage or are otherwise woken up. It's pretty easy to get out of, but it doesn't require concentration, like some of our other options, like Hold Person, which paralyzes a humanoid who fails a wisdom save for up to a minute with concentration. We'll also pick up Enlarge Reduce to represent Serif's Megamorph. 
but unfortunately, since Enlarge Reduce can't make Syrup big enough to ride with one cast, and both it and Telekinesis require a concentration so we can't stack them, we won't be able to truly get the Flying Turtle Fortress. Plant Growth is another Syrup skill, in this case Mother Nature, making all the plants in a 100 foot radius of a point we choose become overgrown, effectively making it especially difficult terrain, so creatures have to spend 4 feet of movement for every foot they move. Stinking Cloud is a weaker Hydra Poison, forcing any creature who starts their turn in the 20 foot radius cloud to make a constitution save. If they fail, they lose their turn as they spend it coughing and choking on the poisonous smoke. I was a little surprised to learn that Dimension Door is actually the lowest level teleportation spell on the bard list. I thought they'd at least have Misty Step, but apparently not. Oh well. All that means is that we can't use our cover move as often as we might like, but when we do, we can jump up to 500 feet. Hold Monster is another paralyzing shout, working pretty much exactly like Hold Person, but without the humanoid restriction. Regenerate takes a full minute to cast, and heals us 4d8 plus 15, then passively heals us 1 HP every turn for an hour. So it isn't great to use in combat, but it can definitely help us stretch out our hit dice, especially when combined with our Song of Rest. Our last paralyzing shout is Power Word Stun, which stuns one creature within 60 feet if they have no more than 150 HP. They're automatically stunned for one turn, then they stay stunned until they pass a constitution save. So if they're unlucky, they could be stunned for a very long time. And we'll finish off with True Polymorph for our final transformation, Atrocity. The spell can change creatures into objects and vice versa, but we're going to focus on changing creatures into other creatures. If we change ourselves into a creature, we replace our stats with the creature's stats, and can't use any of our own abilities. Though we do keep our alignment and personality, so we don't need to worry about attacking our friends. The spell lasts for up to an hour with our concentration, though if it lasts the entire hour, the change becomes permanent until it's dispelled. Once the spell does end, we go back to the amount of HP we had before transforming, though if it ends because we hit 0 HP, any excess damage carries over. That said, what form works for Atrocity? Well, we can change into any form with a CR equal to or less than our level, so 20 or lower. Atrocity is a demon in the anime, but None of the CR 20 or lower fiends really grabbed me, so in a tribute to our Hydra skill as well, my pick is actually the Hydra Pelucranos from the Mythic Odysseys of Theros book. Pelucranos is a CR 19 Hydra with 5 heads to match Atrocity's head and 4 arms, each of which can make an attack, and which can even regenerate if they're cut off. The full stat block is in the book, and though we don't keep the legendary actions, we do keep the legendary resistances, so it should be suitably game-breaking when combined with the rest of our party. Now that the build is complete, the question becomes, how good is it? Well, we are incredibly hard to bring down. With over 250 HP, 21 AC, self-healing, and the ability to turn into a Hydra with another set of 230 HP to chew through that can also itself regenerate HP, we are not going to die without an immense amount of effort. We also have a wide variety of spells to impede our enemies, protect ourselves, protect our friends, traverse dangerous terrain, pretty much anything we might need to do. And we really earn our place as the leader of Maple Tree by being pretty good at helping out our friends. With our bard abilities providing healing support and mobility, and spells like Holy Aura to protect them from harm. On the other hand, other than constitution, our stats are generally low leading to low damage, poor saving throws, and low save DCs on our spells. Dexterity in particular is a very common saving throw that we are just not good at at all. We also have a lot of concentration spells, including all of our transformation spells and most of our paralyzing shouts. And finally, I'm honestly super bummed that we didn't get a giant flying turtle. That would have been incredible and I'm really sad that it didn't happen. I guess, technically, we could true polymorph one of our friends into, like, an Ankylosaurus, and then let the change become permanent, and then use telekinesis on them, but that doesn't really strike me as a good solution. Sally might be up for it, though, so let's see what she's got going on. As mentioned, Sally's real name is Risa Shiramine, and she is much more of a gamer than Maple, to the point where she's actually won trophies for it. She started playing New World Online after Maple had already become somewhat famous, and she designed her character to complement Maple's so they could be a good team, choosing the Swashbuckler class. With that said, what do we want from this build? Well, Sally is an evasion tank, someone who's hard to hit not because of armor, but because she can dodge anything that comes her way. 
Sally's especially affected at this, as she managed to unlock a hidden skill that required her to take no damage at all until she hit level 25. She's also somewhat more offensive to complement Maple's defense, dual wielding daggers in combat. And to go along with her daggers, we'll also need to pick up some magic, both for offense and to boost our speed and mobility. Looking over at ability scores, unlike Maple, Sally is an experienced gamer who carefully chose how to allocate her stat points, so we'll do the same and do a point by. If you want to roll for stats, that's fine, but make sure your dexterity, intelligence, and wisdom are high enough to multiplex. We'll start off with an 8 in strength. We don't really need it for anything, since we'll be going pretty all-in on dexterity, which will make a 15. Constitution is another 8. Sally actually did put 0 points into vitality, and if we're going to be dodging everything, then we don't need the extra HP anyway. We'll put another 15 in intelligence, and a 14 in wisdom. Sally is one of, if not the most familiar with games in the entire guild, and she usually serves as the guild's strategist as well. And we'll finish up with a 10 in charisma. Sally's friendly enough, but she tends to step back and defer to Maple when it comes to meeting new people. We made Maple a dwarf, so it makes sense to me that Sally be an elf, in this case a sea elf. All elves get plus two to their dexterity, and we'll use the racial customization options from Tasha's to put our other plus one into intelligence. We also have 60 feet of dark vision, proficiency in perception, advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and we can't be put to sleep by magic. The main reason I picked CL for Sally is that she has a maxed out swimming skill and can hold her breath for 40 minutes. And CLs have a natural swimming speed and can just breathe underwater. They can also communicate simple ideas with any creature that has a swim speed, like, say, Syrup if he's a reflavored crab. And we get proficiency with spears, tridents, light crossbows, and nets. Sally's noted multiple times to be particularly athletic in the real world, which gives her an edge in the game world, so we'll make her an athlete for proficiency with athletics and acrobatics. We would normally also get land vehicles, but we'll switch that out for proficiency with video games in general. Come to think of it, she's actually won video game trophies, so she actually could be a pro athlete, depending on your view of esports. We'll start Sally off as a monk for unarmored defense, making our AC 10 plus our dexterity and wisdom modifiers as long as we aren't wearing armor. Along with martial arts, letting us use dexterity for our unarmed strikes and monk weapons, use a d4 for their damage, and make an unarmed strike as a bonus action after taking the attack action. We also get two skills from the monk list. Sally knows much more about games than Maple, so history is a good fit, and we'll pick up stealth as well. At second level, we get unarmored movement to contrast with Maple's slowness, increasing our speed by 10 feet while we're not wearing armor. This does include our swim speed as well, and the increase will keep going up as we get more monk levels. We also get Key, a pool of mystical points that fuel our monk abilities. Step of the Wind lets us dash or disengage the bonus action, and doubles our jump distance for the turn and Flurry of Blows lets us make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action after taking the attack action. An option that doesn't come up often, but that actually really fits Sally especially well, is Patient Defense, letting us dodge as a bonus action, which gives us advantage on dexterity saves and gives disadvantage to any attacks made against us until our next turn. If any of those attacks are ranged attacks, we can also deflect them with our reaction if they hit, reducing the damage from the attack by 1d10 plus our dexterity modifier and monk level. If that reduces the damage to zero, we can even spend a key point to catch the weapon and throw it back, using our martial arts die for the damage. For our subclass, we're going to go all in on the daggers and become a Kensei. We can pick two weapons to be Kensei weapons, one melee, one ranged. Sally pretty much exclusively uses daggers, but if you want to pick scimitars as well, see if your DM will let you count daggers as your ranged weapon since they're throwable. If they say no, it isn't the end of the world, we get more Kensei weapons at 6th level, so get whichever one you didn't get here. Kensei weapons count as monk weapons, and we get proficiency with them, so between unarmed strikes, daggers, and scimitars, we have bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage covered. If we use the attack action and make an unarmed strike as part of it, we can increase our AC even more with Agile Parry, giving us an extra plus two AC until our next turn if we're holding a Kensei weapon. For some reason, there isn't a spell that makes cutting winds, which is a little odd considering how common a trope that is, so for Sally's Wind Cutter, we'll approximate it with Kensei's Shot. As a bonus action, we can make it so any ranged attacks we make with our Kensei weapons deal an extra d4 of damage for the rest of the turn. Remember, even though daggers are melee weapons, they can be thrown, which makes it a ranged attack. As a Kensei, we also get Way of the Brush for proficiency with either Painter's or Calligrapher's tools, but neither is especially in character for Sally's, so go with whichever one fills your soul with joy. 
Fourth level monks get to slow their falls, reducing falling damage by five times our monk level. For our first ability score improvement, we'll go with the mobile feat, increasing our speed by another 10, letting us ignore difficult terrain when we dash, and stopping enemies from making attacks of opportunity against us in the same turn we've made a melee attack against them. At fifth level, we get extra attack, so we can make two attacks instead of one. We have too much going on with our bonus section to actually use the two weapon fighting rules, but with this we can use two separate weapons without penalty, and if one of the attacks is unarmed, we can still use our agile parry. Remember that an unarmed strike doesn't have to use your hand, it can be a kick, a headbutt, anything, so we can still be holding on to two daggers. Our martial arts damage also increases to a d6, putting our unarmed strikes and daggers on par with our scimitars. And if we hit with a melee attack, we can spend a key point to make a stunning strike, forcing the creature we hit to make a constitution save or be stunned until the end of our next turn. At 6th level we get even faster as our unarmored movement increases to plus 15. Both our unarmed strikes and kensei weapons count as magic for overcoming resistances, and we can spend a key point when we hit with a kensei weapon to deal extra damage equal to our martial arts die once per turn. This can be used with either our melee or ranged kensei weapons, so a thrown dagger could do 2d6 plus 1d4 plus our dexterity modifier if we use kensei shot as well. Then we can make an unarmed strike with our second attack and still get the plus 2 AC with agile parry. Next, we'll pick up Stillness of Mind, to let us end one effect of charming or frightening on ourselves as an action, and Evasion, to take no damage from a successful deck save and only half damage on a fail, if normally we would take full damage on a fail and half damage on a success. For our second ability score improvement, the Athlete feat further leverages Sally's real-world athleticism to increase our mobility, by increasing our dexterity by one, letting us stand from prone using only 5 feet of our movement instead of half of it, giving us a climbing speed, and letting us make a running jump after only 5 feet of run-up instead of 10. Actually, combining the climbing speed from Athlete and our natural swimming speed from being a Sea Elf, we kinda don't even need the improved unarmored movement at level 9, since it lets us run on walls and liquids as long as we end our turn on solid ground. In addition to our unarmored movement speed boost increasing to 20, level 10 monks also get Purity of Body, making us immune to disease and poison. Now, Sally is explicitly not immune to poison in the original, but if she hangs around Maple long enough, I figure she'll be exposed to enough of it to build up an immunity, going by how that works in New World Online. At 11th level, our blades get sharper, both because our martial arts die bumps up to a d8 for better damage on our daggers, unarmed strikes, and scimitars, and because 11th level Kensei learned to sharpen the blade. As a bonus action, we can spend between 1 and 3 key points to give a Kensei weapon that much of a bonus to attack and damage rolls for a minute or until we use the feature again. I still believe we can get our AC higher, so we'll use our next ability score improvement to pick up Defensive Duelist. As long as we are holding a finesse weapon, we can use our reaction to add our proficiency bonus to our AC when we're hit with a melee attack, possibly causing that attack to miss. Now, technically, Martial Arts doesn't make a weapon finesse even though it lets you use dexterity for the weapon's attack and damage rolls, and that is the literal definition of a finesse weapon. Which is why I chose to go with daggers and scimitars, both of which are finesse, so we can use them for this feat. Tongue of the Sun and Moon lets us understand any language, and lets any creature understand us. Useful for an online game that could have players from all over the world. And at 14th level, Diamond Soul gives us proficiency with all saving throws, as well as letting us re-roll a failed save by spending a key point. Our unarmored movement also increases to 25 at this level. We'll finish off with 6 levels of wizard to get our hands on some magic, like Firebolt, which deals up to 4d10 fire damage with a ranged spell attack, Message to whisper to a friend at close range, and Minor Illusion to make small illusions to trick enemies, like making it seem like Maple's shield is gone. We'll also pick up Silent Image for more robust illusions, Identify to see what loot drops from our enemies, and Gift of Alacrity to give us or an ally plus 1d8 on initiative. Sally has healing magic in the game, but wizards aren't especially good at that. We do get healing elixir though, which spends a minute to make a potion that heals 2d4 plus 2 HP when drunk. We'll also pick up Jump to triple our jump distance for a minute. We can normally jump up to a number of feet equal to our strength score, so combine this and Step of the Wind to jump up to 48 feet after a 5 foot run up, which is a pretty respectable leap skill if you ask me. For our last spell at this level, we'll pick up Find Familiar, because Maple has Syrup, so we need Obero. Again, there's no Fox option on Find Familiar, so I'd call Obero a reflavored cat. We also get Arcane Recovery, letting us regain expended spell slots on a short rest once per day. 
The slots regained can't have a combined level greater than half of our wizard level, so by the time we're done we'll be able to get up to a third level slot back. Second level wizards pick a school of magic and we'll go with blade singing to learn the blade song, as well as getting proficiency with performance. A number of times per day equal to a proficiency bonus, we can start up the blade song as a bonus action. It lasts for up to a minute, and while it's active, our speed increases by 10 feet and we have advantage on dexterity saves. We also add our intelligence modifier to both our AC and any concentration saves we make. We'll also pick up Mage Armor, because our wisdom is just low enough that our AC with Mage Armor is actually one higher than with our unarmored defense. At third level, we get second level spells. Mirror Image is Obero's Shadow Clones, making three duplicates that can take attacks for us. When we're attacked, we roll a d20 to see if the attack targets us or a duplicate. If we have three, we need to roll at least a six. If we have two, we need to roll an eight. And if we have one, we need to roll an 11. The duplicates have AC equal to 10 plus our dexterity. And if they're hit, they're destroyed. It lasts for a minute without using concentration, so we could stack it with a concentration spell like invisibility. Not sure why we would, though. Having three duplicates would kind of give away our position, which defeats the point of being invisible. Unless the duplicates themselves also become invisible, but that defeats the purpose of having the duplicates in the first place, don't stack mirror image with invisibility. With our last ability score improvement, we'll bump our intelligence up to 18 for better spells, concentration, and AC, and we'll pick up Shape Water, a cantrip that lets us move water around, freeze it, and make minor sensory effects with it. Fifth level wizards get third level spells. Tidal Wave is Sally's Torrent skill, conjuring a ton of water that splashes down in a 30 foot long, 10 foot wide area dealing 4d8 damage to any creature in the area who fails a deck save and knocking them prone. It also puts out any fires within 30 feet of the area it hits. The real prize though is haste for Sally's super speed. While haste is up, our speed is doubled, we get plus two to our AC, we have advantage on dexterity saves, and we can take an additional action on each turn that we can only use to dash, disengage, hide, use an object, or make one weapon attack. Sally has been known to work herself to exhaustion though, so when the spell ends, we need to rest for a turn before we can do anything. Our capstone is the 6th level of Bladesinger for another 3rd level spell slot, as well as extra attack. Now normally there's no point to getting extra attack from two different classes, but the Bladesinger version is special because it lets us replace one of the attacks from it with one of our cantrips. Now that'll usually be Firebolt, but the flexibility of being able to make an illusion, send a message, or shape water if we need to, is pretty good. Now that the build is complete, the question becomes, how good is it? Well, we are very good at avoiding damage. We've got 17 AC off Mage Armor, which goes up to 25 with our Blade Song, Haste, and Agile Parry, and can cap off at 31 as a reaction with Defensive Duelist. We also have proficiency with all saving throws and can re-roll failed saves, evasion and advantage on dexterity saves from Blade Song and Haste, and multiple ways to reduce damage or redirect attacks. We're also great at avoiding harmful status conditions, being completely immune to poison, disease, and sleep, able to break out of fear and charm as an action, and standing from prone with only 5 feet of movement. Speaking of which, we are incredibly mobile. We have 65 feet of movement normally, which increases to 75 with Blade Song and then doubles to 150 with Haste, along with both climbing and swimming speeds, great jumping ability, and the ability to breathe underwater. With Haste and Blade Song up, we can even dash three times in a turn to go 450 feet in a single round. On the other hand, we absolutely need to be good at avoiding damage because we have somewhere around 70 HP on average. If we roll the absolute max on all of our hit dice, we cap out at 128. If the dice turn against us or if the enemy has power word kill, then we're just gone. Our huge AC is also highly conditional. Defensive Duelist uses our reaction, so it's only once per turn and can't be used in the same turn as Deflect Missiles. Agile Parry needs us to make an unarmed strike with the attack action, and Blade Song and Haste both have limited uses per day. Evasion also only applies to dexterity saves, so saves using our other stats that still do half damage on a success are a major problem, like for example, Maple's Illusory Dragon, which is an intelligence save and still does half damage on a success. And finally, I'm going to be honest, I couldn't think of a third con to put here. Originally, I was going to say that with low constitution, we're bad at concentration, so it's dangerous to rely too heavily on haste since when the spell ends, we lose a turn. 
But as I was writing up the script, I realized that between Blade Song and Diamond Soul, we actually have plus 9 to concentration saves and can re-roll if we fail by spending a key point. So even if someone forces a concentration save on us with, say, Sleet Storm, we should be just fine. I even asked a couple of other friends of mine who DM to take a look at the character sheet and try to find a third weakness, and they couldn't. I was not expecting Sally to be so incredibly good at avoiding damage, even though that's what she was designed to do. I honestly don't know whether I'd rather fight Maple or Sally as a boss. Maple can do a ton more damage and has way more health, but she can be whittled down over time, while Sally has much lower health and damage, but is practically impossible to hit without the right spells, to say nothing of fighting them at the same time. Either way, they make a fantastic team, and there's a very good reason why Maple Tree is so dangerous, even with only 8 members. I hope you enjoyed the build. If you have any feedback or suggestions for characters you'd like to see me build, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching, friends. I will see y'all later.